I think people like the idea they can easily say, "Oh, well, that was just a costume," you know, and uh, well, you know, without actually. They're, they're under it. obligation to prove that. Yeah, you know, and that's where they get a, a free pass. Uh, and and I, I tell people, when it comes to this film, don't bring in a skeptic to say no. Yeah. Without, unless he can prove something. Sure. You know, because if he can't prove anything, he needs to be shown the back door. There's, there's, there's too much on this film, and they do tremendous damage to, to the reality of, of this thing. Greetings and welcome to The Vortex. I'm your host, Daniel Allen Jones, and I'm here with M.K. Davis. Good to meet you. MK, it's an honor to be here with you. You've been a part of some very interesting work regarding the Patterson-Gimlin film, and you've done plenty of different enhancements and a lot of work to show that there are incredible things to be found in this film that no one has ever really uh, seen before, and we're just going to get right into it. So, MK, tell us how you first really got involved with dissecting this and doing all the great work that you've done with it. Well. It became a project of mine. Uh, I was into astrophotography, and that's you know, space photos through a telescope, and some of that involves specialized type filtering and that type of thing. And when, when I saw a couple of frames from this film that they were had been filtered much the way you filter an astrophoto, for and it, they, they were such high quality that it told me that that they could not have come from the same film that I had seen on TV that was all shaky and grainy, that there was a better version of it somewhere out there and that if it could be located that perhaps the film would tell its own story and, and that, that sort of became a project of mine, an inquiry into the original film, where it was and how I could get those frames and then each frame I could treat like an astro photo and, and get, get it at its best form and then put it all together and then you have a cinema that is that will tell you something. It's, it's not completely a tease. It, it, actually, it actually has you know, merit in, in, in the form of information, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that, that's sort of what got me started. Well, that's pretty incredible. Did you have, and of course, the Patterson-Gimlin film is one of the, what most people find to be the most authentic footage of what we call Bigfoot Sasquatch taken from Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin back in uh, Bluff Creek, California in 1967. And so, when you first got into this, did you ever really have any kind of notion or thoughts on Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or anything like that beforehand? No, I had actually seen the film when I was a kid in a theater and you know your impressions of course it was the impressions of a young person was, was it it was real but it wasn't in its best form you know it's it's there again it's a, kind of all over the place a, a lot of people don't even show the first part of the filming because it's so violently shaky yeah you know that it just takes up air time and they, they rather you know go on with their with their story but um, when you look at it analytically, it contains some of the best stuff. Uh, and so if you're able to get that and bring it all to center like this right here and let the background do all the shaking and, and hold her steady, it, it just becomes a much more remarkable piece of footage and tells you a lot of things. Yeah. So you have done some stabilization because the original, like you said, it was so shaky and very hard to really find what was going on for the first portion of the film until you finally get that part where a lot of people uh, describe as frame 352. Yeah. And you see that's where the famous you know, movement like that occurs right. and people see that. And that's probably one of the most stable parts of that whole footage without any alteration. And so you've taken it and stabilized it. And what has that been like to really kind of put it all together in a way that is coherent and seamless? Well, as I took each frame apart and, and you identify, you know, for a color photograph is made of many components and, and you have, you're asking the lens to bring all those different colors into a common focus and, and only the most expensive lenses do that. 
most what comes in a normal standard camera does not. You don't notice it because everything is wide field, but if you magnify, then you start to see the halos, the little rainbow effect. And so it, it contributes to the overall unsharpness of that image. So what I do is uh, filter that, identify which color it is and delete it either digitally and in the old days they filter it out with filters. But, and then that you, your sharpness boosts 20% probably when you do that. And then each frame has to be done that way. And then you reassemble in a, in a stabilized fashion the entire film and one night, two in the morning, you hit the button, it says preview, and you look at it, and your jaw just drops because it's just stunning how good this film really, really is. It's incredible. Yeah. So did you have any kind of thoughts of this could be a fake or is this the real deal? Uh, what drove you to process all of this in a way that we can see it through a very stabilized fashion? Well, I think that, that I, I considered that it could be a fake. You know, I, I really didn't know or, or under, or I, I was gonna let the film do the talking. Yeah. You know, that, that the worst enemy of a hoaxer is an analyst because he's gonna put it all under a microscope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I say he or she, there's a lot of good female analysts. I mean, in the film industry. So you know, it's it's uh, it's it, it's it's uh, when I first looked at it, and and we could, you know, this is just a short run of the movie. You see how stable it is. It's incredible to yeah. see all in this motion like this. And this isn't the beginning of the film. This is kind of like you said, right? The, the famous movie. look back scene. You know, where she's kind of open, walking open style, out on the sandbar, going upstream. And this isn't something you just did one time. You've gone back and you've been looking through this for quite a while. Right, I have, and as 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 a new new methods come become available, you know, to improve it, because if you can just get one percent improvement in resolution, you're going to see about ten new things on average. Yeah, you know, and that's significant. And so each time that that there's a better way of processing, I redo the whole thing because. Uh, you, you don't know what you don't know what those ten things are going to be. Yeah. You know, so th this has continued to yield and yield and yield and yield, and that's the hallmark of authenticity. It's because a hoaxer only has in his film what he's built into the film. Sure. And it doesn't just keep giving and giving and giving. Yeah. You know, uh, so you have when you're doing a live event, it's not in the control of of the camera operator. Well, then hundreds and hundreds of things show up in the film over and over again so you you, you that's the way it's been uh, yeah for the Patterson film I, you, you got to say that if I had to, to bet my life on it or, or yeah I would say off, I'd go with authentic that's really amazing and this could be you know over 50 years old now it's still could be one of the most uh, authentic pieces of, of evidence of video footage that we have of this type of creature and it's something that a lot of people know about even if you don't uh, really know much about the research that goes behind the Bigfoot phenomenon even if you don't believe it at all most everyone knows the picture of who we refer to now as Patty right. in that frame of 352 and so let's get into some of the key features that you've uncovered when analyzing this footage well let's just go back like I said I had these uh this prepared for a presentation, these images, this group of images. And so I'm essentially just uh, showing you some of the things that I had shown an audience at one time. I, I developed a method for uh, what I call uh, uh, transitional frames, for inserting transitional frames. The fr film was shot at less than 16 frames per second. And what kind of footage, what kind of film was used in that original one? Are you familiar? Uh, yeah, it was uh, Kodachrome 2. Okay. Uh, there's the second most stable film in the, in, in the industry. Yeah. The only thing better was Technicolor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me get wet my whistle here. Sure. And with the footage that they used, are you finding that the quality of the uh, original 
film is difficult to work with in some regard or is it something that you found okay well this will be a piece of cake or what, what were your thoughts on that this is a frame i got from miss patterson and it is from the original. She saw, told me that it was, and, it, and I believe that it is. It, it, it shows. And this is Roger's wife. Right. You see how stunningly clear this frame is. Yeah, wow. This is frame 352. So the analyst can take this one frame and, 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 and using enhancement techniques, see an awful lot of things on it. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go to, back over to here and show you uh, one particular thing. See, you can, wow. That's using what they call false color enhancement. Uh, and uh, in other words, the hair is a different tone than the skin, but they're close. So when you look at them and it's low contrast, then you can't see a lot of difference between them. It looks kind of homogenous. But when you pump false color in, it, the, the skin does not react the same as the hair. So they diverge. Yeah. And so you begin to see things start to pop. And so there you see the differences between the skin and the hair. And you see those breasts that they're mostly skin, there's a little bit of hair, but not a lot, not a lot. Yeah, and that's a big feature that a lot of people, the general public that has probably heard about Bigfoot, but isn't too familiar with this particular, uh, the details, uh, this is actually a female. Female, right, and, and, and uh, by all standards that we know about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah by, and, but with tremendous musculature. I mean, look at this, across here, at, if, you, if you make her six foot seven, this is going to be ten and a half inches across this bicep, and that seems to be the likely scale that we're dealing with around that around that size. Yeah, it's really uh, amazing to see the features in a different light and be able to kind of get an idea about the musculature, the flex, and, and you know a lot of people generally think, oh well, this was just a hoax. It was a costume. They just pulled a prank. But in order to have something like this back then, it was probably extremely unlikely that even in the special effects industry we might have had anything. What are some of your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, it, 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 it's, well, it wasn't available back then to have anything like that. CGI was not available, certainly, and, and, and so the things that they use today and the tools. But what, what you find uh, as an analyst that people will try to cop this film as something they could do. Yeah. Uh, people in that industry. Uh, because it's good for business. Sure. You know, they say, oh, that's a, simply a suit. I could build one of those, you know. Uh, but nobody has. Yeah. <laughs> well, it seems like they, uh, there are some who have attempted to uh, reenact, so to speak, the whole event uh, with a sort of a makeshift costume of sorts. And it's it just falls short of anything close to resembling what we actually see in this Patterson-Gimlin film because with the seams and the costume, the, the bagginess of some of the openings on the limbs, it just doesn't fit the description and the appeal that we see here. See, that, the breasts move when you animate them. You see, uh, that, that kind of thing is very, very difficult to do. Uh, and, and so the two guys said that she had pendulous breasts and the film agrees. That they swing and they, and they swing with a great deal of weight. Uh, there's a lag time, you know, like she makes her little stomp. You say it's, they're not, it's a lag time, you know, you, in other words, up and then they come up, yeah, and down and then they come down. And that indicates that they're dense like water, you know. Uh, so, so what they said about pendulous breasts is verified in the film, and you can go uh, item by item through this film. And, and, and defeat objections using the film itself. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, you, and to me, that's immensely better than somebody just arguing about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I think people like the idea they can easily say, "Well, that was just a costume," you know, and uh, well, without actually. They're, looking they're, they're under obligation to prove that. Yeah. You know, and that's where they get a, a free pass. 
Uh, and and I, I tell people, when it comes to this film, don't bring in a skeptic to say no. Yeah. Without, unless he can prove something. Sure. You know, because if he can't prove anything, he needs to be shown the back door. There's 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 too much on this film, and they do tremendous damage to to the reality of, of this thing. Yeah. Uh, to to let them just have uh, you know full damage it like that, you know, and I, I blame TV shows because they like to show we're going to show both sides. No, they don't have a side. Yeah. <laughs> all they're, all they're doing is saying no. You just say no, 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 and that that's not scientific, and 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 it's because of the world we live in nowadays that you can't, the average person cannot make a discovery because of these skeptics. Yeah. Uh, the, the, and I, there's nothing wrong with being skeptical, but there's flame in skepticism, you know, where they just they know to everything. It, it's it's a, uh, it should not be allowed. It should not be allowed. It's, it's too damaging. Yeah. And you've seen some of the other frames that seem to indicate that not only is this not a costume, but there's a lot of feature and the the tone of the the body structure and, and a lot of these things. It, it, this is in that early part of the film, and that's where I said all the interesting stuff was in that shaky, grainy part. But Patterson was actually down below the subject. Uh, and I, I say the camera operator because you don't actually see Patterson. Yeah, but uh, assuming it is him, um, you see that there's you know he's down below, he's down behind an embankment, and he's going up at her as she walks away, and you can see right up into the crack of her butt, and you can see clearly, and this has been a big objection when it comes to uh, when it comes to this film is that people say well it looks like a pillow in the rear end, but nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> see, I mean. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, that that kind of thing is hard to build build into any kind of suit. That, if you pulled a suit up in there, that she couldn't walk. I yeah. mean, you pull it up in there that tight. Uh, so you know, it's 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 just is what it is. And it's been my pleasure to. And if it had come the other way, if it had gone the other way. If you saw zippers, things like that, yeah. I would not have had a problem with it, you know, because my goal was to get the film in its best form. And when when it, when I did, that's what the kind of things that you saw. Yeah. And and it's it's more more of it of the of the glute show. See, there's some more frames. Uh, that there again, that's in that first first uh, shaky part. But here's another one. Uh, See the muscles move under the shoulder, scapula. You see the glutes. Wow. See them pumping on either side. You can see the division. You know, that's stuff that we see every day in life. You yeah. Know? I don't go out and wonder if the people that I see on the street are real or not. Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you can't just completely set the bar so high that, 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 that you can't believe anything about anything. Yeah. Uh, that, which is what skeptics are doing, professional skeptics, I mean. Not, not just skeptics, but professional skeptics. Uh, a skeptical person should say, well, you know, I saw that film and it, I just don't believe it. And he, if he saw this, he should change his mind. You know, he said, well, I never saw anything like this. I didn't know this was out there. You know, but that's not what they're doing. Yeah. They're going no to everything. Everything. It, it just seems that a lot of people, it's very hard for them to accept in their current state or current paradigm of whatever they are under the impression of that this can also exist. It seems impossible to them that this is a part of reality, so they just filter it out. And unfortunately, I think it's something that is affecting our ability as a society and as a culture to bring in new parts of nature or parts of nature that aren't necessarily new but have always been there but we're just discovering and if we don't consider those possibilities then we're limiting our scope of the world well what are you seeing here that's not unbelievable uh i mean you're you're seeing a a, a gluteus maximus here that's that's everything like what you see but seven billion people have that uh you're seeing the muscles under the scapula there moving up and down Seven billion people have that. 
you know, uh, you, you even see a little hairstyle coming down the back. Yeah, so that's another uh, yeah. issue. Is we, we talk about Bigfoot, people t generally think that it's, it's covered in hair or fur or something like that. And this is an interesting part that um, you know, we're seeing here. The, the closest thing I think people relate Bigfoot to is like a gorilla or a, a great ape. But the hair structure on a lot of these um, things that you've found seem to have a special quality to them. So what are you finding about the hair that stands out to you? Well, the hair, the hair is, doesn't, doesn't appear to be human-like or gorilla-like. It, it, it must be just Bigfoot-like. Uh, let me show you. I consider this to be a, a sample of Bigfoot hair. It was found at when Bigfoot was seen. And it, 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 I'm not an expert in hair, but I can see some particular things about it that it doesn't appear to have a core in the shaft. Uh, there, there's a translucence to the hair. Uh, kind of a clear, clear hair. Uh, maybe not totally clear. See, they got colors to them. Yeah. But but there's no medulla in there, and, and they play tricks with light. Uh, let me show you. Tricks with light. That sounds very interesting. And I know a lot of people find the, the uh, sightings of Bigfoot to be very mysterious, and these encounters are very elusive. So do you think that, that the quality of the hair might play into that a little bit? Absolutely, I do. Uh, if you look at the, how tight the scales are against this hair shaft, that gives it reflectivity. If they were sticking out like this, you would have a dull hair, it wouldn't reflect. Uh, a, a lot of horses' manes, they stick out like this. You know, you have a long, silky, straight hair, but it's, it's not shiny. Uh, but if, if, you, if your scales are packed tight against there, they're going to reflect. And these reflect and refract. Huh. They do both, and so when that's where the light comes into being. Yeah. This is a completely clear hair. It, it has no color, no medulla. It's got scales. You can see the scales. You can see the debris through it in this photograph. Wow. So you, you end up getting a, a, a that's where uh, the microscope light actually travel down this hair shaft and just come bursting out, you know, at some irregular place. But they seem to hand off the light from one hair to the other to the other, and they just kind of flood with light. And so you get an effect, like I want to show you on the Patterson film. Watch when she gets close. You'll watch that, watch her hair, I mean, her, the back get very blonde. Wow. And then darken back down. You see, you see that's this lighter colored tree trunk, the light from it hit reflects across. The hairs just hand that color off. And they just it just make, comes and go, goes across there in a wave. And then if you were to come upon this scene and she wasn't walking, she was just standing by that tree, you probably would not see her. That's a really incredible notion. And it's one that I think uh, really puzzles the community of researchers or people who have just had experiences or encounters when we're dealing with the nature of these creatures. Do they have these abilities to blend in to the background or, or the foreground or do they use some kind of camouflage technique or uh, like some may suggest are they completely uh, phasing in and out of reality, like uh, an interdimensional type of phenomenon. So what you're seeing here might indicate that the, the hair qualities can uh, actually change the effect of what we're perceiving. But the hair is an organ. It works just like the rest of the organs. And th their hair works as some kind of a protection or camo. And I don't know that they, they, they're not able to manipulate their hair. You know, a lot of animals can. Get, get, get a dog angry and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or a razorback pig. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, they all, they'll manipulate their hair. If they had hair like this and made it just stand up and catch the light, you know, maybe something like that. It's just, you know, theorizing, but something like that is going on. And you can call that a phasing if you want to. 
I, I don't think it's phasing. I, I, I think it's just taking advantage. They have a, a method of taking advantage, and all of that would disappear 30 minutes before dark or 30 minutes after daylight. This is strictly a daylight thing. And this seems to also have a possible connection to why a lot of people seem to have these sightings uh, more at night, and at the daytime, it's difficult to really maybe pinpoint what's going on if this is, in fact, what they're able to do. Well, what, what is a sighting? Yeah. You know, what is a sighting? What, what composes a sighting? Uh, because it, it doesn't involve just the fact that you laid your eyes on it. It, it involves whether you're cognizant of, of it, whether you analyzed it correctly. Yeah. And you see it and you recognize what it is. Uh, if you don't do that, then you haven't had a sighting, even though your eyes saw it. It seems like it's something that a lot of people, they try to process in their mind and maybe even play down like, oh, no, 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 that was just a bear. It couldn't be anything else. And unfortunately, that leaves a lot of people in denial of something that otherwise would be really a, a, a very significant uh, encounter, in, in my view. And when we're looking at the qualities of the hair and how it might take, um, really play a role in, in these different encounters, uh, and we're looking at the back here, is there anything that you found on the other part of the footage, maybe where she's coming from the front view or turning around that you've happened to notice? Uh, yes, yes, uh, yeah, I have. You know, when it, why it's having a hard time loading up is because even though this is short, it contains many, many images. And, and like I said, this new processing requires the insertion of transition frames in order to get the flicker out of the film. Uh, because it's, it's, it's taking it less than 16 frames per second. So one frame is going to go like this, and the very next frame is going to go. And there's going to be all of this motion lost. Yeah. And so the, 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 the mind disconnects itself from, the, from one to the other. So it looks like flicker. And so to, to avoid that, you take the two frames and kind of meld them at various transparencies and then insert them in, and then you get a smooth bridge from one to the other. And, and it's, it's, the effect is marvelous. Uh, first I'll just play it and then I'll start stopping on that one particular area. You see what I mean? You can go very ultra slow and still be smooth. Wow, yeah, it looks fantastic. Right there. You'll see now, you know, it'll approach this lighter color when you watch it reflect. See it? Wow. It flashed. It that came off of here. That light came off of this this branch right here that's light colored. And watch it do it again. It's like somebody hits the the, the the hair with a flashlight. See it? That's pretty incredible. So it looks like the, the coat or fur, hair, whatever we're dealing with here, has a very shimmering type effect to it. It does. It, 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 it'll take light and it'll pass it, it'll flood through hair to hair to hair. Uh, if, 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 if they're near an object that's bright. You can see it lighting up here. Yeah, you can see it. The, skin, the, skin, the hairs are not that thick on there. Some people might suggest that that could be due to like a rubbing of the hands sliding back and forth like that. What are your thoughts on that possibility? I think that is, that's probably accurate. You see the strip right here. You see the actual leg muscles there. See it? Yeah, you can actually see that. It's a, so after a while, you have some it, chafing it, or something. It constantly does its thumbs like this. If you watch, I've got it isolated. It constantly rotates the thumbs in some nervous fashion. You know, uh, so if it does that, then, then you're gonna, you don't do that. Yeah. So there we see it starting to uh, diminish again. Well, I got, I got a long ways to go. You'll get there. Because you want to do this, you want to go one frame at a time, because you want to see the moment that it happens.
You see how many frames are in this little clip? It's incredible. And you pieced all these together. Oh, right. They had to make them. You had to, you know, put, they had to be put together correctly. 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 10 frames increasing in transparency from one to the other until you're at the next frame with no transparency, you know. Yeah. That, it, it, it's a bridge. You hand it off in a slow fashion and it eliminates flicker. I think that's going to be a stick, I believe. Maybe. Maybe I've gone past it. There it goes. Wow. Hold on. See it? Lighting up. Lighting up. It's, it's, it's getting the light from here. There you go. Back. Going back. So it's just very brief. Very brief. But if, it's, if it held that position, it, it would stay. So there are a lot of features on the body that we're seeing, the musculature. It seems like this is probably a pretty well-built individual. Uh, like a, a super say like a body, bodybuilder, but I'll say bodybuilders don't compare. <laughs> yeah. They don't compare and it, you can't be friends with a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch because even if they hugged you, it'd probably kill you. Wow. <laughs> uh, ten and a half inch biceps, uh, they're, they're so heavy. I found a set of prints out there in, in Bluff Creek in, in October of 2015. And it was the sandbar gets incredibly hard at that time of year uh, in, in the fall. And these were four inches deep. Wow. Uh, right at it, 10 centimeters. So they have a lot of yeah. weight, a lot just, of density to just, their body composition. Yes, yeah. If it, if it stood, stepped on your foot, it would crush every bone in your foot. Wow. You know, that there's so much physical, physically overwhelming that, that you can't be friends with them. You can't, you can't allow them to, to touch you. It's that big of a difference. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. So, you know, like we said, a lot of things with the body, but I think one of the really big things to consider is what are some of the things you found with the face and the head that stand out to you? when analyzing this footage? I know that the mouth moves considerably. Uh, and then, well, let's take a look at it. So what are we seeing here? Seeing the jaw move down like this. See that move, movement right there? Wow. See this? And I, I can show you an enhanced version. Watch this. There's a the ear. Wow. There's a little braid of hair that the wind has blown over the ear. There's about a nine mile an hour wind to her back under her mouth. And that's that's the braid hanging over her right cheek. Wow. The, the wind has taken it over the ear and exposed the ear. It's a little herringbone pattern. Probably has a little bone clip right there. That's what I take it to be. It's big on each end. That's very interesting. And, and, yeah. and so we're interpreting this as a braid, and it seems to be something that stands out. And, and you've seen this. You can see it right there. There's something here on that brow, right there on the right side of the right eye that's falling down. You're yeah, right. Uh, I, you can actually file. I don't have that file with me, but a little further back in the wall, you can see it swing around in the wind. It swings around and you can, it gets profile and you can actually see the little braid on the end. It's a, it's a strand of hair about this long and on the end is a little braid. And the, in this case, it blows up over the ear. The ears, there's your ear. And it just hangs over the cheek and it doesn't last but a few frames and it's back, you know, you know, it just hangs there for a second. Yeah, and this goes by so quick and yeah. it almost looks like that ear is just very well rounded. It's not let, like drawn down or big earlobe, or at least that we can see. Yeah, it's, it's a, 
it's a it's a fairly large you know it's as large as our years in 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 relation aspect ratio but it doesn't have the the lobe you know that we have a long lobe so we put earrings or whatever in and it doesn't seem to have that you see it I mean it's it's just round um, which you know I, it, that that's that's information that you just you write it down and 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 make note of it because I, I don't know anything about what significance that is except that you know in, in the film it shows to have a round ear and somebody would say well how do you know I said, there it is you know and that's why I said if the film has such power yeah because there's not any way some you can you can continue to say no to anything but if you say no, you can't see its ear. People have always said you can't see its ear. That's why I object to it. But, yeah. you, but you can. <laughs> yeah. It seems like it's yeah. right there. Yeah. Looking at yeah. it right it's, there. It's, it's kind of damn. It's low contrast film. So you have to kind of just boost contrast. But I have all the original raw footage that I've used to work with. So I, I can go back and demonstrate anything. You know. Uh, so no, no. You know, just I, I call it. There, there's there's real skepticism. There's flaming skepticism, and there's stupid skepticism. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can get just plain stupid with it, and and and, and so well, she never opens her mouth. What? Well, well, there it is. You know? It seems and, like there's something that we can view the fi the film here that shows us that, like you said, that with that jaw movement, maybe the lip distortion there. It very well could be that she was, if anything else, just moving her mouth, but possibly even speaking, talking, making some vocalizations. Well, I mean, if you, if, when you watch this video here, watch yourself, cut the sound down. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll see pretty much the same thing, you know. Uh, so, it, when, when, it, when it comes to an examination of a film, and somebody's asked, asked this, I want you to examine a film that that's got the most incredible thing that we've ever seen on it and tell me what it, what it is well you don't say well you know Bob and Roger said this Bob and Roger said that you leave them out of it so they're, they're out of the film you know I know their story but just put the story to the side yeah and let's look and see what's on this film because this film had it's only 60 seconds worth of film. Yeah, it's you know what I mean? Right, so uh, 50 years ago, Bob was there. But what is his memory? What, how, is, how would your memory be after 50 years? It's something you have to yeah. consider, you know? And while they're, like you said, they do have their account of this whole thing taking place, it makes us wonder if they do recall altogether exactly what happened and just like you would with any case that's a historical one where you look back decades into something and say well do I remember spot on um, verbatim what took place or maybe there was a few things and so it what's really interesting is it seems like you've uncovered some pretty interesting parts of this whole segment this whole piece of film that aren't very noticeable at first glance and may not have been noticeable to the people that were there. And so what would you find are some of the controversial things that you have been able to kind of get an idea that could potentially be right here in this whole sequence that aren't really well known? Well, I mean, you want to talk about controversy. There's controversy here to be had in Bucketfuls. Uh, what, I, what I've seen, and I don't have the files to show you here, but what I've seen is that they're consistently in this film are, are shadows uh, that are cast that indicate that the film was not taken in October. And, and the sun doesn't, doesn't change for anybody. You know, in October, they know exactly where it is and where it, it, where it can't be. And it can't be straight overhead in October at that latitude. It comes across at an angle. I know that from astronomy. And you can actually measure shadows and tell exactly what time of year it is. And, and I've even had it looked at by a professional person 
and they say not October. That's really interesting to, to consider why it might be said to have taken place in there, but maybe there was some other reason for that. Well, that's why I always, always try to feed it a little bit. Uh, I try to put it aside, the story. Uh, the, the story does not agree with the film in many ways. Uh, they, the fact that they, they took it on a Friday and showed it on a Sunday is not possible. Not with Kodachrome 2. If, if Kodachrome 2 used to protect their methods for processing that, uh, under, I mean, they just did not let nobody know how. But now it's known. But it was so involved, they had a two week minimum turnaround time. Wow. Uh, it, it, they would take the reel of film off of the reel, spaghetti style, and dip it, dip it down in a, in a dye, okay? And you got three layers of dyes in that film. And they, they knew how the penetrating time it took for that red dye to go to the bottom layer. So they time it, time it, time it, time it, time it. Okay, take it out. Take it out. Wash it, shh, dip it in bleach, and they bleach back out. You've seen all three layers because it went to the bottom. So they bleach it back out. They have to time the bleach. So it only goes through two layers. Oh. So take it out. Okay, and then they they take that, wash it, and so they got two clean layers and a red layer. Okay, then they put it in the next one, which would be. Uh, Maybe blue. I don't know who, uh, which one it is, but they know, they know how fast it penetrates. So they put it down in that dye. Tick 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 tick. They don't want it to go into the red layer. So at the exact moment they take it out, and then they wash it off, and then they got uh, blue, blue, red. <laughs> you see what I mean? Okay. And so the the next layer they, they have to stick it back in bleach. And it, it only let it go 10 seconds, something like that. Take it out, then you wash it off. And so you got a, a clear layer, blue layer, red layer, you know. And so then they put it in the final dye and they, got it. they can't let it go through to the other layers. They have to take it out right to prescribed time. And it don't seem like that could even work. It's so complex, but it produces the most stable footage in the industry. It, you, it will last and last and last a hundred years later, it will not be deteriorated. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, that's why you know the original film is still good, wherever it is. But <laughs> they, you can't do that. You can't take the film on Friday and show it on Sunday. So that was a mess up, you know, in, in their story. So there's something that could be more right, to that. Right. The, the film was most likely already in the can. The, the, shadows, the shadows indicate late summer. Yeah. So th that means that the film was already taken, already in whatever form they wanted it in, and they were just able to show it, and we took it two days ago. You know. Uh, does that mean it's a hoax? No. That means that just they had something they didn't want to talk about. Yeah. But the film is authentic. And it, it, it stands on its own merits. And ultimately, it doesn't need those two men. It doesn't need them. It doesn't need. It doesn't even need me. Once I'm, I'm done with the work, you can look at it with your own eyes. I, I could sh tell you, but I did this, I did that, but you know what you're looking at. You know the, the glutes working. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 bio. What do you call it? Biomechanics. Yeah. What we see every day. So there's a lot to it. There's a lot that's yeah. happening. What are your thoughts on the possibility that there could be additional figures? embedded somewhere along this uh, sequence. Well, you go back, go back to that, what we saw in the hair thing and think about that, that if it went, they weren't moving, they're just standing beside a tree, that there's every possibility there was other figures out there. And there's even some that I, I suspect in the film, but I don't have those files with me. Yeah. It's a really interesting notion to take in consideration, like you were saying, if they have this ability, this camouflage um, effect that if they stand still, maybe or they're part of a certain lighting scheme or something that can really um, conceal them, we might not even know if they're standing right there. 
they know that they can get beside a tree and be hard to see. They, they know that. What do people call them? Tree peekers. You know, peek at you around a tree. See if you're gone. You know, they hang with the trees uh, because it, they, the, 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 in daylight, the light from those trees interplays on their hair. And they obviously know that. that they use, utilize it. You see it in this film. Yeah, you, 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 you watch the effects as it goes through the trees. And you see it, you know, and other people say, this is what I saw. It, it just disappeared behind this tree. Or I saw it peep at me from behind a tree. I didn't know it was there. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, and the effect of the light goes away when it becomes dimmer and dimmer. You know, if it gets later in the day, early in the morning, it doesn't have that 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 protection. Well, you know, there are a lot of people out there who think that Bigfoot and Sasquatch and these whole sightings and encounters, they're all just made up, hoaxes, nonsense, things like that. What is your view and what would you say to people with that frame of mind? I'd say, uh, you know, keep your skepticals on, like Ray Crow used to say. Uh, they, people will hoax, people will mistake, make mistakes. But based on this film, there's Bigfoot out there. You know, so you, you take them all, you take them all, seriously. You take them at their word. You put, test them if you can. If you can't, make notations. Yeah. Yeah, because they're out there. And having probably done some of the most in-depth analysis, enhancement, and work on this footage out of probably anyone else in the world, what do you find is the most significant issue or detail or just overall concept that we can glean from the work that you've done and the whole footage and the idea that there is a subject here which is unknown? There's an awful lot more to it than meets the eye. And, and it, I could get into some of that, but it would take hours to talk about it, but uh, there's more than meets the eye. And so I've kind of skimmed over some of the, I think, what are considered important points, but um, it, it's, you're, if you go out there, you, you have to be careful that you have enough working knowledge that you don't get in trouble with these things because they can hurt you if they want to. Uh, this particular type right here doesn't look like Patty. It has more all-encompassing. They're very aggressive. They're very aggressive. They have a foot that looks different than Patty's. All of their toes are toward the front of the foot. They're splayed. They're like sausages. They're long. Uh, this one right here, he was lucky. This uh, forestry worker, Paul Freeman, took this video. I think mid nineties, maybe, um, and he was lucky to get away with his life. Uh, let me show you. This is just a steel frame. Okay, just a few frames later, watch what happens. I, I forgot which way I gotta go. There it is. It's gone. Wow. And he he loses it in the camera, pulls his camera down, and he says, "Oh Jesus!" And then it's, all of a sudden it moves again, and you can see it again. Now let me show you the actual video. It's stabilized. So this could be corroboration that there may be something to yeah. this camouflaging effect. Watch it now. There it is. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You lost it. Where is it? Where is it? You see it? <laughs> watch, it. watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Wow. You see what I mean? Yeah, that's really yeah. incredible. You don't, you don't go trying to chase these things, especially those kind that I call, I call them true giants. Uh, they, you, it's not going to use a lot of skin on Patty. That very little skin on this thing. It's well haired over. Uh, it, it doesn't walk a smooth gait, a patty. It walks with kind of an up and down lumbering motion. Its feet are different. And 
almost universally, they're not nice. You know? Yeah. So, so you know, that if you see that particular type of track, you know, it's best, especially if it's fresh, to just kind of back away. Don't, don't, don't go forward, because if you do, you might walk within two or three feet of it. Well, and that yeah. would be a, a, an eye opener. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. long. You just don't want to do that. Yeah. And, and, the, and the hoop has told me that if you encounter one of these, you speak to it in whatever language you have, it doesn't matter, and back away at the same time. And the kind of idea behind that is, is it confuses the Sasquatch or the, or the big, true giant Bigfoot. It doesn't, it's not sure whether you're alone or not. There, it thinks maybe there's an unseen person and it, it holds back, you know. So uh, that's kind of what he did. If you play that again, you'll hear him talking to himself. There's nobody with him. Oh, there you go. You know, it thinks he's talking to somebody over here. You know, so it, it stares at him. It stops and stares and actually considers doing something to him. But then it goes on its way. Wow. <laughs> Probably very shocking for him. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. It keeps going. Yeah, it keeps wow. going. It, it, it saved his life, you know, the fact that it was confused. Well, okay, it seems like you've done probably uh, the most work and the most in-depth analysis that anyone's done on this footage and looking into some of these things that otherwise no one would really know about. And I think that's a very commendable thing to take the time and the effort to look into what's possible with some of these pieces of footage which otherwise are very distorted and we don't really get a good idea because it's grainy, it's shaky. But what you've done is, I think, a, a very impressive part of how we understand more about this phenomenon. So while we like to say we won't know if we don't go, you've gone into this footage. You've gone in and tried to find and look and see, like you said, what's there. And like you said, regardless of who's involved, the film can speak for itself on its own merit. So I want to say thank you for your time sure. here today. Thank you. And we'll have to stay in touch because there's so much more enhancements with the technology. And right. maybe at some point we'll find a bit more that we didn't see before. The longest one minute film in history. That's it. That's this film. If you liked this video, be sure to check out our other content and get connected on our page and social media sites. Every day, new discoveries are being made all across the world and beyond. So let's work together to find out what's next. And remember, we won't know if we don't go. I'll see you in the vortex.